let's resume for our final hour. And the final argument that I want to offer on behalf of God's existence is the ontological argument. Um, in order to understand this argument, you need to understand what philosophers mean by a possible world. A possible world is just a way the world might have been. Uh, it's not a universe or a planet or any sort of a concrete object. It's just a description of reality. Uh, it's a description of the way the world might have been. So the actual world is the description that is true. Other possible worlds are descriptions that are not in fact true, but might have been true. Now to say that something exists in some possible world is just to say that there is some description of reality that might have been true that includes that entity in the description. To say that something exists in every possible world means that no matter which description is true, the entity will be included in the description. So to illustrate, unicorns do not in fact exist, but there is some possible world in which unicorns exist. On the other hand, many mathematicians believe that numbers exist in every possible world. Now, with that in mind, consider the ontological argument, which was discovered in the year 1011 by the monk Anselm of Canterbury. A a God, Anselm observes, is by definition the greatest being conceivable. If you could think of something that was greater than God, then that would be God. So God is the greatest conceivable being, the maximally great being. So what would such a being be like? Well, he would be all powerful. He would be all knowing. He would be all good. And he would exist in every logically possible world. A being which lacked any of those properties would not be maximally great we could conceive of something even greater. So the question is, uh, could such a thing as a maximally great being exist? And this argument uh, goes as follows. Number one, it is possible that a maximally great being, otherwise known as God, exists. Two, if it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. Three, if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. Four, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. Five, therefore, a maximally great being exists in the actual world. Six, therefore, a maximally great being exists Seven, therefore, God exists. Now, it might surprise you to learn that steps two to seven of this argument are relatively uncontroversial among philosophers. Uh, most philosophers would agree today that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows logically that God exists. So the whole question comes down to premise one. Is it possible that God exists? Well, what do you think? Uh, the atheist has to say that it's impossible that God exists. Not simply that God, in fact, does not exist. He has to say it's impossible for God to exist. He has to say that the concept of God is logically incoherent, like the idea of a married bachelor or a round square. But the problem is that the concept of God just doesn't appear to be incoherent in that way. The idea of a being, which is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every possible world, seems to be a perfectly coherent notion. Um, moreover, we've seen that there are other arguments for the existence of God, 
that seem to suggest that it's at least possible that God exists. So I will simply uh, leave it to you. Do you think that it's possible that God exists? If so, then it follows logically that God does exist. So let me ask if, there, if there's any question on this ontological argument for God's existence. And notice again, if this argument is sound, it completely undermines the problem of evil because it gives us an all-powerful, all-good, metaphysically necessary being. Yes, way in the back. Well, again, what does it mean to beg the question now that I spoke to before? Remember, to beg the question means the only reason you accept a premise to be true is that you already believe the conclusion. Now, is the reason you think that it's possible that God exists because you believe that God exists? If, if, if so, then it is begging the question. If the reason you think God's existence is possible is because you think he exists, that would beg the question. But that's not the way I presented the argument. I, I presented the argument as saying that the idea of God seems intuitively coherent. Um, and that we have other arguments for God's existence that seem to suggest that um, this is a, a possibility. So one is appealing to the coherence of the concept of God, not begging the question by assuming God exists. Yes? Yes, uh, one could run the argument as a kind of ontological disproof of God's existence. It's possible that a maximally great being does not exist, in which case it would follow that a maximally great being does not exist. And so that's why I say it all depends on, number one, do you think it's possible that a maximally great being exists, or do you think uh, it's not possible? Um, and which way you go with that will determine the conclusion. Yes, down here. So you would have to say that one of the possibilities is the logical possibility and the other one is an epistemic possibility. Very good, yes, that's correct. Imagine that I were to write on the blackboard some complex mathematical equation that is, is almost incomprehensible. Now, the equation is either necessarily true or necessarily false, but we don't know which. And so you might say, well, it's possible that it's true. It's possible that it's false. But what you would mean is what, is what he called epistemic possibility. That is to say, for all I know, it's true or it's false. But it's not really possibly false if it's true, and it's not really possibly true if it's, if it's false. It's necessarily true or necessarily false. So you're absolutely right. When someone says, well, it's possible God exists, it's possible he doesn't exist, that's only true of epistemic possibility. It just means, for all I know, God exists or he doesn't exist. But we're talking here about possibility in a more robust sense, uh, uh, a broadly logical sense. Is it a coherent idea, a co coherent concept of a metaphysically necessary being. So that's that's correct. Yes? So what you did this morning and this afternoon was bringing us down to the basic questions. What do we believe in? Or what? Well, I, I suppose you could summarize it in that way. I, I don't know. that. I guess that's not how I would have summarized it. He said, he, uh, to repeat, what we've done today is to bring us down to the basic question, what do you believe in? Well, in, in the sense that, yes, do you believe these premises or don't you? If you believe these premises to be true, then the conclusions follow logically. That's right. You cannot affirm the premises and deny the conclusions. But I don't want to say it's just like a sort of leap of faith, like the one girl who said, that's just your opinion. No, we, we give arguments for these premises, like premise two, that the universe began to exist. We went into some detail about philosophical and scientific reasons for affirming premise two. So, so in one sense, yes, it, it comes down to what do you think about these things, but it's not as though it's just a matter of, well, you have your opinion and I have mine. 
we give reasons and arguments in support of what we believe. What I mean is that the basic matters pay whatever you believe one wants. Well, that was what I was just denying. <laughs> he said that the basic thing is faith then. What, what, no, no, it's not. You don't believe by faith that the universe began to exist or that the fine-tuning of the universe is not due to physical necessity or chance. But Roger Penrose doesn't think it's not due to chance because of faith. Richard Dawkins doesn't reject physical necessity because it's of faith. These, there are arguments for these things. So it, it's, it's, it's you know, not at all by faith. Um, so it, it, it's a matter of where you think the evidence points. That's the way I would prefer to put it. Which way do you think the evidence points? Yes? You meet someone who discards the ontological argument. Uh, say again, please. You meet someone who discards the ontological argument on the basis of the modality assumed in the argument, the, the modal object of it. I don't think that somebody is going to reject the ontological argument by rejecting modal logic. I think that's no, but the system, the strong system of the modal. Logic. Yeah, that even that. I think he, he's pointing out that the argument assumes that possibility and necessity are not tied or indexed to certain worlds, that if something is possibly necessary, then it's necessary. And yes, you could deny that, but that's why I said steps two to seven are relatively uncontroversial. Uh, it would be, it, it, it's pretty uncontroversial to say that if something is possibly necessary, that it's necessary. So it would be, I think, a, a move of desperation to try to avoid the argument by denying yeah. the system of modal logic that would say that these iterated modalities don't finally come down to the one closest to the to this the statement being operated on by the modal operator. All right. Well, let's return then to let's see. Our, do we have our PowerPoint slide? Yes. Let's go to that last one again, that last slide. This one? Yes. So, we're dealing with the evidential or probabilistic version of the problem of evil. I argue we're not in a position to say that it's improbable that God lacks good reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. Two, I now argue that relative to the full evidence, God's existence is not improbable. And the point here, to reiterate, is the probabilities are relative to background information. So when the atheist says God's existence is improbable, it's not enough to say it's improbable relative to the evil in the world. He's got to say it's improbable relative to the full scope of the evidence. And I'm persuaded when you consider the full scope of the evidence, the contingency of the universe, the beginning of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world, the coherence of the concept of God, that it's far from clear that it's improbable that God exists. On the contrary, in my view at least, I think that even given any improbability that evil might throw on God's existence, the arguments for God's existence are just a very, very heavy counterweight that make God's existence probable uh, in light of the full scope of the evidence. And the arguments I've mentioned are only some of the evidence that God exists. Alvin Plantinga has given a lecture in which he lays out two dozen or so arguments for the existence of God. And I think the cumulative force of these arguments um, makes it very probable that God exists, even given the evil and suffering in the world. So that's point two. Now, point three is that the Christian faith entails doctrines that increase the probability of the coexistence of God and evil. In doing so, these doctrines decrease any improbability of God's existence that might be thought to issue from the existence of evil in the world. In other words, Christian theism is not so improbable given the truth of these doctrines. Now, the question was raised before, is this begging the question? No, no, it's not begging the question. It's just saying, remember, that probabilities are relative to background information. And what we're saying is that on given Christian theism, it's not so improbable 
that the world should be filled with suffering and evil. So that if Christian theism is true, we're not really all that surprised by the suffering and evil in the world. So seeing all the suffering and the evil in the world doesn't make Christian theism so improbable. Now, I think we may have a slide for this next. Do we have another slide? No, we don't. Uh, so that, okay, do we have another one after that? No, we don't. Okay, so let me just mention what some of these doctrines are. Number one, the chief purpose of life is not happiness, but the knowledge of God. The chief purpose of life is not happiness, but the knowledge of God. I think that one reason the problem of evil seems so intractable is that we just tend to think that if God exists, that his goal for human life is happiness in this life. God's role is to provide a comfortable environment for his human pets. But on the Christian view, this is false. We are not God's pets. And God's purpose for human life is not happiness in this life. Rather, it is the knowledge of God, which in the end will bring ultimate human fulfillment and satisfaction. But many evils may occur in this lifetime which are utterly pointless with respect to producing human happiness in this life. But they may not be pointless with respect to producing a deeper knowledge of God. Innocent human suffering provides an occasion for deeper dependency and trust in God, either on the part of the sufferer or on the part of those around him. Now, whether God's purpose is achieved through what we suffer all depends on our response. Do we respond to our suffering with anger and bitterness against God? Or do we respond with deeper trust and dependency on him and ask him for strength to endure? Whether or not his purposes are achieved through our suffering all depends upon our response. Second doctrine. Mankind is in a state of rebellion against God and his purpose. Rather than submit to and worship God, people rebel against God and go their own way, and so find themselves alienated from God, morally guilty before him, and groping in spiritual darkness, pursuing false gods of their own making. And the terrible human evils in this world are simply testimony to man's depravity in this state of spiritual alienation from God. So the Christian is not surprised at the terrible human atrocities that occur in this life. On the contrary, he expects them. The Bible says that God has given mankind over to the sin it has chosen. He doesn't interfere to stop it. He lets human depravity run its course. And this only serves to heighten mankind's responsibility before God, as well as our wickedness and our need of moral cleansing and forgiveness. Number three, the knowledge of God spills over into eternal life. In the Christian view, this life is not all there is. Jesus promised eternal life to all who would place their trust in him as their savior and Lord. And in the afterlife, God will reward those who have borne their suffering in faith and courage with an eternal life of unspeakable joy. The apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, lived a life of incredible suffering and hardship. And yet he wrote these words, we do not lose heart for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison because we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. Here, Paul imagines, as it were, a scale on which all of the sufferings and the misery of this life uh, are placed on one side of the balance, 
And on the other side is placed the glory that God will bestow upon his children in heaven. And Paul says the weight of glory is so heavy that the sufferings of this life are not even worth comparing to it. Moreover, think about this. The longer we spend in eternity, the more the sufferings of this life shrink by comparison to literally an infinitesimal moment. And that's why Paul could call them a slight momentary affliction. He wasn't being insensitive to those who suffer terribly. On the contrary, he was one of them. But he understood that the sufferings of this life are simply overwhelmed by the ocean of divine eternity and joy which God lavishes upon those who trust him. And finally, fourthly, the knowledge of God is an incommensurable good. To know God, the source of infinite goodness and love, is an incomparable good. It is the fulfillment of human existence. It is what we were made for. The sufferings of this life cannot even be compared to it. And thus the person who knows God, no matter what he suffers, no matter how awful his pain, can still say truthfully, God is good to me because he knows God, an incommensurable good. Now these four Christian doctrines, if true, greatly reduce any improbability which evil would seem to throw upon the existence of God. And thus paradoxically, it seems to me, the existence of the Christian God is not rendered improbable by the existence of the evil and the suffering in the world. So if my three theses are correct, uh, it follows that evil does not render improbable the existence of the Christian God. On the contrary, it seems to me that God's existence is quite probable and that therefore the intellectual problem of evil fails to overthrow God's existence. Let me ask if there's any uh, question about that third point about how evil is not so improbable on Christian theism. Yes? Yeah, a lot of terms of suffering and animals. Suffering of animals? Yeah, like some, like some primates. Yes, I think this is a, a real uh, difficulty that is receiving uh, increasing attention now in recent work. I would refer you, for one thing, to Michael Murray's book, uh, Nature, Red in Tooth and Claw, which is a, a very good exploration of the problem of animal suffering. And one of the things that Murray points out in the book that was very helpful to me um, is that there are three levels that we could speak of a pain awareness. At the lowest level would be simply a reaction to noxious stimuli. For example, if you poke an amoeba with a needle, it pulls back. Non-sentient life, that is say life that is not conscious, like spiders and ants and bacteria, exhibit this kind of quote-unquote pain awareness. That is to say, these organisms react to noxious stimuli, but they don't really feel pain. They're not even conscious. Then you have a second awareness of pain, which would be a consciousness of pain. And sentient life, like uh, zebras and lions and dogs and cats and horses, feel this kind of pain. They have nervous systems that uh, carry these stimuli in their brains, and they have awareness or consciousness of pain. The third level of pain, though, is the awareness of those second-level mental states. That is to say, it is the consciousness that I am in pain. And what is interesting is that there is no evidence that animals, other than the highest primates, like the great apes and human beings, have this kind of third-order pain awareness. And what that means is that even though animals are in pain, 
They're not aware that they're in pain. They don't have the third level awareness, I am in pain. And so in that sense, if this is right, God has really exempted animals from a great deal of the problem of suffering because even though they feel pain, they're not aware that they're in pain. Uh, and if this is right, it, I think it just extols the ingenuity and the mercy of God that he would so construct the animal world that even though these are viable organisms that uh, help to make up the ecosystem in which the human drama is played out, nevertheless they're spared the sort of suffering that we're aware of when we have that third level pain awareness that I am in pain. Um, so that would greatly reduce the problem of animal suffering. And then the question would be, well, why does God allow animals to prey upon one another and so forth? And I think what one could say there is that this is part of the ecosystem in which the human drama is played out on this planet. Uh, and that, um, therefore, this is a, a good thing for God to do. Um, scientists who have talked about the so-called Gaia hypothesis have talked about how the whole Earth is like a living organism which recycles its own waste and so forth. And the existence of carnivores as well as herbivores is part of having a viable ecosystem. You need your wolves and your carnivores in order to keep the ecosystem uh, balanced. Uh, if everything were just herbivorous, uh, they would eat all the vegetation and everything would die. Um, so. It's, it's a balanced ecosystem in which human beings can exist and flourish and this whole human drama can take place. So uh, I think God has morally sufficient reasons for creating animal life that would include an ecosystem having carnivores and that it may well be the case that God has exempted them from uh, significant awareness of being in pain themselves. Any other comment or question on this, these, uh, this last point. All right, well now, that takes us over then to the emotional problem of evil. As I said at the beginning, I don't think that most people who reject God because of the evil and the suffering in the world really do so on intellectual grounds. I think they've rarely thought this thing through as thoroughly as we've tried to do today. Rather, it's an emotional problem. They just don't like a God who would permit them or others to suffer terribly. And so they want nothing to do with them. Theirs is simply an atheism of rejection. It's like Ivan Karamazov in Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, in which Ivan says, I will stay with my indignation and my atheism even if I am wrong. It didn't matter to Ivan whether or not the truth was that God was justified in permitting evil in the world, he preferred simply to remain with his unbelief and his anger uh, because that's what he wanted. Uh, it was an atheism not of refutation, just an atheism of rejection, just rejecting God. And the question here then is, does the Christian faith have anything to say to those who are suffering from the emotional problem of evil? Well, I think that it does. And here we come back to the question of divine impassibility that was raised earlier. I think the Christian faith tells us that God is not some sort of distant creator or impersonal ground of being, but rather he is a loving father who shares our sufferings and who hurts with us. Professor Plantinga has written the following. As the Christian sees things, God does not stand idly by, coolly observing the suffering of his creatures. He enters into and shares our suffering. He endures the anguish of seeing his son, the second person of the Trinity, consigned to the bitterly cruel and shameful death of the cross. Christ was prepared to endure the agonies of hell itself, in order to overcome sin and death and the evils that afflict our world and to confer on us a life more glorious than we can imagine. He was prepared to suffer on our behalf, to accept a suffering 
of which we can form no conception. You see, Jesus endured a suffering beyond all comprehension. He bore the punishment for the sin of the entire world. None of us can comprehend that suffering. Even though he was innocent, he took upon himself the punishment that we deserved. And why? Because he loves us so much. How can we reject him who was willing to give up everything for us? When we comprehend his sacrifice and his love for us, then I think that this puts the problem of evil in an entirely different perspective. For now, I think we see clearly that the problem of evil is really the problem of our evil. Filled with sin and morally guilty before God, the problem is not how God can justify himself to us. The problem is how we can be justified before him. So paradoxically, even though the problem of evil is the greatest objection to the existence of God, at the end of the day, God is the only answer to the problem of evil. If God does not exist, then we are locked in a world filled with gratuitous and unredeemed suffering. But if God exists, then he is the final answer to the problem of evil, for he redeems us from evil and takes us into an incommensurable good, which is fellowship with himself. Well, that concludes what I had to say about the problem of evil today. So let me ask if there's any final question or discussion about anything that we've shared today. Yes. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, also the New Testament, but mainly in the Old, you have a lot of promises for the righteous will be blessed and have a blessed life on earth. And yet at the same time, we have all these problems, suffering, and disease. And and as a Christian, when you read the Bible, it can be hard to put the two together, like losing a family member or have yeah. something. How do you... I guess I see those sorts of promises as being what theologians would call eschatological in nature. Namely, someday God's kingdom will be established, and this will not just be a sort of temporary kingdom in the land of Israel, but it will be the reign of God in which all evil is vanquished and judged and quarantined uh, and, and God takes the righteous into his eternal kingdom, into paradise. And that was this sort of incommensurable good that I was talking about. I see those sorts of promises as ultimately fi finding their fulfillment in the reign of God's kingdom that, that will finally vanquish evil and suffering from the world. Yes? Would you comment on hell and how it relates to the problem? Right. As I see hell, uh, hell is an expression of God's justice. So paradoxically, hell is not evil. Uh, hell is an expression of the justice, the goodness of God, that God is too good to simply blink at evil. Evil will be punished. Justice will be done. What's evil is that there are people in hell. That's what's evil. And that is the fault of those who go there by their own free volition, by rejecting God. Uh, I think the scripture says that, uh, well, it does say that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And it says in another place, God desires all persons to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So the only reason that some people would find themselves separated from God and his grace in a place called hell is because they have willingly rejected God's will for their lives and his every effort to save them. So hell itself is an expression of God's justice and goodness. What's bad about hell is that people are there, but that is due to the fact that people have freely chosen to reject God and, and consign themselves or separate themselves from him forever. Yes? Um, I just wanted to comment on um, something you already resolved about uh, natural pain and the connection to evil. Uh, how, for example, if we uh, hit our toe 
at the corner of the table. We feel pain there, uh, but that's that is uh, that is only to uh, turn our attention to a place where a problem has occurred. Yes. Like if we are sick, we feel bad, and that's just uh, this. It, we might feel bad. We might uh, we we might feel bad about it, but uh, it's. It's actually good that we feel it, that we know that there's something wrong, that we should pay attention to that and maybe fix it. Yeah, there's a doctor, I forget his first name, Brand is his last name, who has done work on the necessity of pain awareness for human survival. And he points out, for example, that people who suffer from leprosy lose their digits, like their fingers and toes, not because the disease eats them away, it's because they have no feeling in their hands, and their feet, and so they burn themselves, they damage themselves, and do harm to themselves because they cannot feel pain. And this man talks about what a blessing pain awareness is for survival. And he said they tried to help some of these patients by equipping them with an electronic device where if they did something that was hurting them, a red light would come on and it would warn them, you're hurting yourself. Uh, even though they couldn't feel anything. And, and you know what? It didn't work. It didn't work. He said that people would just turn off the device if they needed to do something, like, say, turn a key in a lock that was difficult to turn. They would they just turn off the, the, the switch and then turn the thing, even though if you had pain, you'd never be able to do that because it would be hurting your fingers so bad. And so these people wound up damaging themselves anyway because they didn't have pain awareness. So you're right, pain awareness is a tremendous blessing, really. What's unfortunate is when it gets so extreme and, and becomes so horrible and unbearable, uh, that, that's what's, what's the, the, the bad thing. But it can help us to understand, again, why animals would have pain awareness in a viable ecosystem, uh, as well as human beings. So that, that's certainly a good point. Paul Brand is the name of the doctor? Okay, good, thank you, you just looked it up. Paul Brand. Yes, up here. Could you comment on uh, God using theistic evolution to create? How is that good? Yeah, the question was about God's using theistic evolution. I think that this would relate to the problem of animal pain. The problem of theistic evolution gets pulled into the discussion of the problem of evil because of animal suffering. And I've seen it used by both sides of the argument, oddly enough. Um, young Earth creationists who don't want, who don't believe in biological evolution would say that it would be wrong of God to permit millions and millions of years of animal suffering on this planet in order to bring human beings on, on the scene. And that therefore, theistic evolution raises the problem of natural suffering and, and is therefore impossible. By contrast, certain uh, theistic evolutionists like Francisco Ayala would say, uh, given the awful things that happen in nature, uh, like insects which lay their eggs inside the body of another insect and then they hatch out and eat the insect from the insides out and, and destroy and other sorts of a, grotesque things in nature. They say this is proof of theistic evolution because God wouldn't create such grotesque things uh, immediately. So you have people on both sides of the argument appealing to evils or suffering in the world to try to prove theistic evolution or to try to prove creationism. And I guess my attitude would be that neither of these arguments is compelling, uh, especially in light of what I said earlier about animal suffering from Michael Murray. If it's the case that animals do not have third level pain awareness, then it seems to me that they really don't suffer from pain in the way that human beings do. And a lot of what we think of as animal suffering is an anthropocentric projection of human consciousness and agency onto animals. We think of the deer in the forest as being like Bambi, uh, which is really a human 
person that looks like a deer. And in fact, if Murray's right, this is just wrong. Animals aren't aware that they're in pain, even though they have pain. And so it's not clear to me that creating human life on this planet through evolution would be something that would be inconsistent with the goodness of God. It seems to me that that would be um, permissible and that he might have reasons for doing it that way. By contrast, exactly the same thing would apply to those who say that there are grotesque things in nature that a good God would not have created. Um, insects don't even have second order pain awareness. They just have reaction and noxious stimuli. And so for these insects to eat each other and do things of this sort are really just like little machines interacting with each other. They're just like little nano machines. Um, and there's just no moral significance to that at all, it seems to me. So I'm not persuaded by the theistic evolutionist argument either that God couldn't have created these insects that do things that look grotesque to us as human beings. It's because we're projecting onto them anthropocentric values and attitudes that we think it would be, be would be terrible. But when you think of what they really are as just little machines with receptors to stimuli, I think you can see there really isn't any sort of moral significance to that. So I'm rather neutral with respect to this issue, I guess. I, I think we just have to follow the evidence where it leads and what, ask what does the evidence suggest God has done about the creation of biological complexity. And I don't think that philosophical arguments about evil and what a good God could or would do are going to play a significant role or a very significant role in answering that question. Any other comment or question? Yes? Um, I was wondering, what was your motivation to start studying all of this? What was, say again, what was? <laughs> What was your motivation? Motivation? Yeah, to start studying all of this. Yes, the question was, what was my motivation for studying all of this? I guess it would be this. I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family. I became a Christian in high school through the witness of a girl who sat in front of me in my German class and who shared with me about God's love and told me God loved me and that I could know God. and. This just floored me. I had never heard this before. That God loves me? This worm named Bill Craig down there in that speck of dust called planet Earth, it just overwhelmed me. Well, that sent me on a spiritual search that lasted about six months. I read the New Testament from cover to cover. I read Christian books. I was introduced to other Christians in the high school. And uh, I was just captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth as I read the New Testament. There was an authenticity about his life that was undeniable. There was a wisdom about his teaching I had never encountered before. And so to make a long story short, at the end of about six months, I just yielded my life to him and experienced an inner spiritual rebirth in which God became a living reality in my life and just turned my life upside down. And I had thought enough about this during those six months to realize that if this were really the truth, I could do nothing less than devote my entire life to sharing this news with mankind. Because if this is the truth, it is the greatest news ever announced, that there is a God of infinite goodness and love who loves you and wants you to come into an eternal relationship with him forever. I mean, what could be more fantastic than that. Well, coming from a non-Christian home and being uh, having only non-Christian friends in high school, I was immediately involved in explaining to them why I had taken this step. And so offering reasons for faith was with me right at the very beginning. When I graduated from high school and went to university, I attended Wheaton College, which is a confessional Christian school.
And Wheaton strongly emphasized the integration of faith and learning. They wanted us to be able to have a Christian Weltanschauung, a Christian world and life view, so that we didn't stick our brains in one pocket and our faith in the other pocket and never let them see the light of day at the same time. Rather, we wanted to develop a Christian worldview which included a Christian perspective on history, on the arts, on the sciences, on philosophy, and so forth. And so it was at Wheaton that I gained the vision of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in the context of presenting an intellectual defense of the credibility of a Christian Weltanschauung, or worldview. And so I determined at that time that I would pre pursue graduate studies, and uh, that took me then into doctoral work in England uh, on the cosmological argument, and then to doing theology work in Munich on the historical narratives of Jesus' resurrection. And as I, as I looked into this, I was just astonished at what I found. I, even at Wheaton, I had been told that there really aren't any good arguments for God's existence. The only kind of apologetic they gave us at Wheaton was a kind of negative apologetic. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the work of the late Francis Schaeffer, that was what we were uh, taught, namely that if God does not exist, then there is no ultimate meaning, value, or purpose to life. If God doesn't exist, objective moral values and so forth do not exist. And that seemed to be right, but that only gives you a kind of negative apologetic. There were no positive arguments. It was only after graduating from Wheaton and beginning to pursue my further studies that I began to encounter these philosophers arguing for God's existence. And I was astonished at the force of these arguments because they, they seemed to be able to answer all of the objections that I had been familiar with. And so as I looked into these more deeply, I became convinced that there really are good reasons uh, to believe, for example, that God exists, as well as to think that the New Testament is a credible historical record of the life of Jesus. And so it's been a search, an exploration that has developed over time and continues on uh, in my career as a professional philosopher. I'm currently working on the question of divine aseity and God's relationship to abstract objects like numbers and sets and other mathematical objects. And so the, I found that the Christian faith is never stagnant. It's not a brain dead faith. It's a living, active, inquiring faith. And I am a philosopher today because I am a Christian. It is because I am a Christian that these philosophical issues have opened up for me and it becomes so fascinating and, and so gripping. So that, I guess, is, is what has motivated me and why I'm here in Denmark uh, doing this seminar today at Peter's kind invitation. Well, I think on that note, it would be an appropriate time to conclude. So thank you very much for your attendance today. I enjoyed it.